Hello, this is the 124th edition of Catch of the Day, available on the Branch Talk YouTube channel. Today we're going to continue with the reading from uh, the book uh, written by Doug Mitchell, When the Siege Has Ended, Ezekiel 5, The Judgment for the Living. Starting at the near the top of page 20, we read, God cannot bless those who in any way take advantage of another's adverse circumstances or calamity in order to justify their own pernicious ways. In the interests of true justice and equity, he must turn his face away from them and allow them to suffer the sure results of their words and actions. Ellen White says that even repeating a report which one does not personally know is true or false is also a form of bearing a false witness. Therefore, the fire of judgment has gone out from that situation to all the house of Israel and is having the effect of burning them up because of their saying, Aha! and their false witnesses. See Revelation 21.8 In God's eyes, the glory, covering, hair, they, ha they may have had when they were holding up the light of truth to whatever degree has been taken away from them and will continue to be so until and if they repent of their sorceries, thefts, and oppression. As the casting of a portion of the preserved part of the hair into the fire was to cause the fire to come forth into all the house of Israel, then that also must include those in the branch who did not join with Koresh, but who also chose to go some other way rather than following the living spirits of prophecy. After Ben Roden died in 1978, some of the branches joined George Roden for a while in his opposition to Lois's message, or simply refused to keep up with the unrolling of the scroll, and after Lois died in 1986, the fiery trial came upon all who, or upon all of those who, had been associated in one degree or another with the branch. The trial had begun in 1981 when Lois instituted the Lord's Supper daily for all branches, and after she died, the real test had come. After Lois died, rather than getting together and seeking light from the Lord as to what we were to do in that time of crisis, Many of those who were previously with the branch just abandoned the church's identity and property and either followed one or another who was putting him or herself forward as the new leader of the movement or they just followed their own inclinations. In 1981, around the same time Vernon Howell, a.k.a. David Koresh, first came to the branch, Charles Pace began preaching that uh, what would a few years later, in 1984, become his claim to fame, at least in his mind. When he first presented his message to Lois, she saw that there were some major errors in it, so she told him to stop teaching it, but he refused to do so, so she had to place him under a censure which meant that he could still attend the church meetings, but not teach at them. After Lois died, he set up his own association in Alabama and called it Living Waters Branch of Righteousness. Around 1996, he moved to Waco, the Waco area, and began to set himself up on Mount Carmel Center. In 1998, he moved onto the property during the property trial, 
and has been putting himself forward as being the prophetic leader of the branch. Just prior to that trial, he dropped the name of his association and took up the name the branch, the Lord, Yahweh, our righteousness. During that trial, the court ruled that the Kuroshians were not the trustees of the property, but the issue of who was the true representative of the association was left unsettled. Pace had been a part of that suit but withdrew from it and signed a document in which he said uh, that he was acknowledging the Koreshian's claim. Therefore, Pace took advantage of that situation to move on to the property. Since the court would not allow the true issue of who had the right to the property to be resolved, the law enforcement agents there have been somewhat protecting Pace while he is on the property simply because he has public utilities there in his name. He now claims to be the successor to Koresh. One of his newest teachings is that Saturday is not the seventh day Sabbath, but one must use the sun in its quarterly cycles, the two equinoxes and the two solaces, and count the third day after each of those as the Sabbath. He says that since the sun was created on the fourth day, and thus was the day of the equinox, as Brother Hodder said, then the third day following that fourth day was the seventh day and therefore the Sabbath. While that was true that the third day after the equinox was the Sabbath on the creation week, the equinox has nothing to do with the weekly cycle thereafter. Irrespective of that, he concludes that we must also reckon the Sabbath by the sun's quarterly cycles. Interesting? Uh, take care.